The Achaemenid Empire lasted 208 years. The Macedonian Empire of Alexander the Great lasted 231. The Roman Republic lasted 233. Romanov Russia lasted 234. Today, the United States of America is 244 years old. What happens next? Where do we go from here? What do we build out of the ashes? Hello, I'm Kanaz Filan, and these are notes from the end of time. Hello again, and welcome to the 14th episode of Notes from the End of Time. Apologies for the delay in getting this one out. I am busy on a new book, which I am compiling, based largely on podcasts here on Notes from the End of Time, so I will be preoccupied with that for a few weeks. I may be delayed a bit in putting out material, but I intend to keep on putting out material, and thank you to my loyal listeners for giving me the chance to break a decade-long writer's block. I have been able to use these podcasts as a spur for my creativity. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Virgin Mother. And thank you for all of your support. And I wanted to talk in this episode about the absurdity of Christ and the absurdity of Christianity. I mean, obviously, you hear a lot of people today will tell you Christianity is outdated, it's primitive, you're trying to run your world from laws that were written by 2,000 years ago. It needs to get with the times. It needs to incorporate everything we've learned, you know, all the teachings of science, you know, if it's going to be relevant at all. And, you know, I can see that's a fair question. I mean, we are talking about how, why would you look back to what people thought in 1300 or in 300 to handle a crisis in, 20, in the 21st century? But so let's look at this show. Let's try to bring Christianity up to date with our times. Let's get Christianity back to where it was in the roots. And you know, let's look at that. Okay, first of all, it would have been a lot easier for a Romans or for people of that time to accept the idea of God men. That you know, you could tell somebody Yes, my tribe was comes from a man who from a man who was born of a daughter with a queen and a wolf. Oh yes, and my tribe comes the sea serpent. You had those myths were all across cultures and times. Yeah, they still are. The idea that somebody was a demigod or that somebody was even a god, Alexander the Great was still being honored in temples, you know, as a god in the Roman Empire. So that wouldn't have been a huge stumbling block for them. The thing about the the Roman world was they would have expected that this god man had accomplished some kind of great divine feat. I mean, of course, well, this is the ancestor who went on, the, the ancestor of our tribe who went on to found our tribe, killed a monster, and that's how he became king. He drove out invaders, that's how he became king. You know, he, he did some great feat in the world of men to show that he was a child both of gods and men. And so what great feats did Jesus accomplish? Well, he healed the sick, and... Now, sophisticated Romans might just raise an eyebrow at them. They had certainly seen itinerant magicians you know, promising to heal diseases. They may even have seen the lame miraculously cured and the blind cured in demonstrations in the marketplace. And a clever Roman might note, ah, yes, that healer cured that man's blindness in the marketplace. And Last year, when I was at Ephesus, he cured the same blind man of blindness. And three weeks ago, two towns over, he did the same miraculous cure. I mean, people fake faith healings today. People faked faith healings then. It's you know, these, A second-hand report of a parlor trick wasn't really going to be incredibly impressive to the Romans. 
Well, he fed 5,000 people with loaves, seven loaves and five fish. I mean, we feed thousands every day. We provide bread and circuses. He turned water into wine and walked on water. These were parlor tricks that they're talking about here. They'd seen magicians. There were entertainers in the Roman Empire. There were people who made a living bilking the gullible by performing tricks just like this. What they're, descri what they're describing doesn't sound at all like a god-man. It sounds like another grubby little sorcerer applying his trade. So Jesus has a kingdom in heaven. Well, that's wonderful. What about his kingdom on earth? Well, he tried taking over the temple. Jews rejected him. The Romans crucified him. And now, people in 1st and 2nd century Rome had a basic familiarity of Levantine history and specifically of the history around Judea. That province had been a thorn in Rome's side for centuries. The populace was regularly getting riled up by one self-proclaimed holy man or another. Jesus was just one in a long line of prospective messiahs that came before him and that came after him. There was nothing particularly impressive about his reign. For 134 to 136, a guy named Simon bar Kokhba, who was considered to be a messiah by many in Judea, took over a nice section of what we today call the Holy Land for a couple of years. That was the last Jewish state in the area between then and 1948. Rome was well familiar with sorcerers. Rome was well familiar with rebels that got themselves crucified. It would have had no problem believing that Jesus was either or both of those things. They would definitely have a very hard time believing he was God. And Imperial Rome and late antiquity did not have many of the scientific and technical advances we take for granted. But even then, even in the Dark Ages, people were aware that as a general rule, virgins don't have babies. And then as now, people were generally more inclined to blame lechery than to swallow the story of the Holy Spirit descending on it as a dove. The early Christians spoke of Parthenos, a virgin birth. Christianity's opponents made jokes that what had really happened was Mary was visited by a lusty Roman soldier named Pantheros. And if you were ever wondering where the band got that name from, that's where. One epithet that becomes popular when describing Jesus is that he's not the son of God. He's the bastard son of a menstruating whore. So speculation about the virgin birth was nothing new. That was just as difficult a pill to swallow in the first century as it was in the 21st. In the Roman Empire, educated pagans did not believe Zeus had literally descended on Leda as a swan or that had literally mounted Europa as a bull. They thought those stories, like we do today, they thought they were myths that pointed towards higher truths. They thought that they were stories. They didn't believe in those things as literal. They would have thought that they were ridiculous then, just as they would think that it was ridiculous to say today that the Holy Spirit came down in the form of a dove and impregnated a young Jewish virgin named Mary. The Roman world was well aware that people die. They could see crucified criminals anytime they went outside the gates of the city. They had seen people die and had buried relatives, but they were aware that death is generally a final thing. They, they were not at all adverse to the idea that the spirits of the dead could live or they could communicate after death. There was necromancy practiced pretty widely throughout the Roman Empire. Then as now, spiritualism was popular. But the idea that a dead body was somehow going to rise from the tomb and go around walking. I mean, if anything, they would have found that idea terrifying and uncanny. 
Certainly, they, it was a hard it pill to swallow then, again, just as it is now. Educated Romans also drew hard and fast lines between religio and superstitio, or as we'd say, religion and superstition. Seneca, two decades after the crucifixion, says, religio deus colit, superstitio violat. You know, religion honors the gods and superstition profanes them. Two Romans, you know, as Varro said, a superstitious man is afraid of the gods. A religious man honors the gods like his parents. He does not fear them like his enemies. Romans thought there was an appropriate way to to respond to the gods. Basically the same things we do today. You, know, you give them the pinch of incense. You sing their praises. You, know, you honor them. You don't spend a great deal of time quivering in terror, like, oh, gods, you know, let this curse pass from me. Oh, you know, gods, grant me these boons. You were expected to have, there was a place for the gods. They were, it, it was generally understood that the gods would stand back and had given you your talents and you were expected to do with what, what you could with the life you had. Spending too much time expecting the gods to intercede for you would have been a sign of superstition. It's a sign you're scared of the gods. You're like that crazy person everybody knows who goes to half a dozen different tarot readers every time like the decision comes up. That was seen as a bad thing. And certainly the way the Christians handled their cult. You're talking about you believe in miracles. You've got this guy who rose from the dead. And you're telling us everybody who refuses to join your cult is going to be damned to eternal torment. They would have dismissed Christianity as the worst kind of superstition you know fit for nobody but the poor, the slaves, and the gullible. And even all that might have been forgiven by the Roman authorities. Rome was famously tolerant of foreign cults and welcomed them. You could find temples to Serapis. You could find the Mithras cult all over the empire. You could find Isis. Imperial citizens of Rome were just as fascinated by foreign cults and wisdom from distant lands as Victorians were fascinated by Indian spirituality, as 21st century New Agers are fascinated by indigenous traditions. This is nothing new. Victorian England was fascinated with Indian spirituality 21st century New Agers were fascinated by indigenous cults from every, quote, unspoiled, quote, stretch of earth they could find. There's nothing new under the sun. This is classic behavior of imperial citizens. They were generally welcoming to foreign cults and could have been welcoming to Christianity, except that not only did Christianity insist on that virgin births and resurrections. They insisted that their God was the only God. Their scriptures were the only true scriptures and that any homage given to any other gods was idolatry. And that meant that they, Christians, would not participate in public ceremonies dedicated to the Roman gods. That was rather a big thing. At that time, uh, their, their ceremonies were like our 4th of July ceremonies, like our holidays that are intended to... They were holidays to bring people together. They were... You came out to show your support. You know, you may be... It's kind of like the way when a church today holds a fundraiser, they got a barbecue, you want to go over to St. Michael's, or yeah, that little black church, they're having a great, have some great barbecue, you got to go pick up a plate, they're having a fundraiser this week. It was that sort of thing, and everybody got went out together and had a good time. It was perfectly harmless, except in the minds of these crazy Christians who insisted it was idolatry, 
who not only would not attend services, these festivals, they would tell their fellow congregation members not to go to these services. They would abuse people outside and tell them that they were on sacrificing to idols and that the only true God was Christ. This threatened the Roman social order, and the Romans really, really treasured the social order, and when they felt it was threatened, they frequently responded quickly and brutally. The famous slaughter of the Christians in 64 after the Great Fire when Nero burned a bunch of Christians in the arena Tacitus reported that he did it not so much on the charge they'd burned the city as of hating the human race. And yes, a lot of the Christian persecution stories were exaggerated. There was less martyrdom than many Hollywood movies or many of the old books of the martyrs would have you believe. Martyrdom was the exception. It wasn't the rule for the most part. But being a Christian did mean that you were at any time at risk of having the government decide you had to go sacrifice to idols. And okay, what the government was asking you to do was we have a statue of the emperor up here. You have to kneel. You've got to take a little pinch of incense. You buy that from one of our licensed incense sellers, and that was a hot contract. Then as now, government corruption was the norm, not the exception. But all they wanted you to do was take a pinch of incense and ask the gods to preserve the emperor's good health. And yet the Christians stubbornly refused to do that in the face of imprisonment, torture, even death. They were willing to suffer all of that rather than give the emperor a pinch of incense. We have an interesting bit of correspondence from the year 112 between Pliny the Elder, who was the governor at the time of Bithynia as a province in modern-day Turkey, and the emperor Trajan concerning Christians. Trajan is not well remembered among Christians. He's remembered for persecuting Christians. But Pliny is writing to him, and he's saying, you know, what am I supposed to do? The Christian sect has been springing up like a contagion in Bithynia. It's all over the cities. It's all over the towns. It's even getting into the small villages. And I recently had some Christians brought in, examined a couple under torture, had to ex execute a couple who refused to recant, and I wanted your advice, my emperor, on what I should do. Trajan writes back and he says, These people, Christians, are not to be sought for, but if they are accused and convicted, they are to be punished. But with this caution, that he who denies himself to be a Christian and makes it plain that he is not so by supplicating to our gods, although he had been so formerly, may be allowed pardon upon his repentance. As to libels sent without an author, they ought to have no place in any accusation whatsoever, for that would be a thing of very ill example and not agreeable to my reign. So let's take a look at what Trajan said here. They are not to be sought for. You don't go on a witch hunt. Don't start attacking Christians with government forces. Don't have soldiers coming to their churches. But if Christians are accused of being of Christ, this crime of Christianity, and also libels, he doesn't want the libels sent without an author. If somebody who's willing to stand up and state his name accuses individuals of being Christians, then they should be tried, and if they're convicted of Christianity, they should be punished. However, you have to give them the chance to repent. You've got to give them the chance to deny being a Christian, 
to supplicate to our gods, and if they do that, then they should be pardoned. There are lots of stories of brutal Roman persecution of of poor, innocent Christians. And, you know, as I said before, it happened, but what the Romans wanted above all else was law and order. You know, as Roos Bolton said, a peaceful land, a quiet people. So long as the Christians weren't causing any trouble, he was fine with tolerating their idiocy and encouraged his governor to do so. Should somebody, should they cause trouble to a point where a Roman citizen who was willing to come forth publicly would say, you know, X is a Christian, then we should, of course, in, you know, see what's going on here, like try to figure out what the problem is. If we get these people together you know, and they're willing to meet us halfway, give us their pinch to the gods, do that, that's all we ask of them, and then they can go back about their business. All I care about is law and order, but of course the people who won't cooperate by sheer virtue of their stubbornness, have to be treated harshly. And about 90 years after the correspondence between Pliny and Trajan, in the first decade of the 3rd century, a young newlywed new mother named Perpetua was arrested in Carthage for being a Christian. We have her prison diary. It's one of the first pieces of Christian literature, the first piece of Christian literature to my knowledge, written by a woman, and it describes her experiences after being arrested. One of the first things that happens is she gets a visit in prison from her elderly father. He's been trying to discourage her from this whole crazy Christian cult, and now here she is in prison, and he comes there he gets down on his knees from behind, from the other side of the bars. Daughter, have pity on my gray hair. Have pity on me, your father, if I deserve to be your father. If I have favored you above all your brothers, if I raised you to reach this prime of your life, do not abandon me to be the reproach of men. Think of your brothers. Think of your mother and your aunt. Think of your child who will not be able to live once you are gone. Give up your pride. You will destroy all of us. None of us will ever be able to speak freely again if anything happens to you. And Perpetua, in the face of her father's tears, sympathized. She was greatly moved, but she refused to recount her faith. A few days later... She's at her trial. The old man comes up as they're walking up there. He's in the audience. We walked up to the prisoner's dock. All the others, when questioned, admitted their guilt. Then when it came to my turn, my father appeared to my son, my infant son, dragged me from the step and said, Perform the sacrifice. Have pity on your baby. Hilarianus, the governor who had received his judicial powers as the successor of the late proconsul Macunius Timinianus, said to me, Have pity on your father's gray head. Have pity on your infant son. Offer the sacrifice for the welfare of the emperors. I will not, I retorted. Are you a Christian? said Hilarianus. And I said, yes, I am. All the authorities wanted was a little bit of cooperation. They just wanted these crazy Christians to see reason. And the Christians just steadfastly refused. They And the harder you tried to force them to see reason, the bigger their cult got. You'd hold trials hoping that would scare the Christians into behaving and people would jump up from the audience, proclaim themselves Christians and be led back to the dungeon with the people on trial. They'd go to the arena singing like it was something to be happy about. 
Roman authorities had no idea how to deal with this crazy behavior, and so Christianity became one of the many problems that were plaguing the late Roman Empire. And you know, by the end of the crisis of the 3rd century in 302, a guy named Diocletian comes to power, and he launches what we call today the Great Persecution. They remove Christian soldiers from the ranks. Christian freedmen are now returned to their former masters. We're going to raise Christian churches to the ground where we find these Christian scriptures. We're going to burn them. We're sick of this. We've had chaos. The empire needs law and order again, and we need to get rid of this cult. Thousands of Christians were martyred during the persecutions. Many more lost jobs, lost homes, were exiled. And yet all those enthusiastic efforts did not stamp out Christianity in the Roman Empire. In fact, the persecutions were in 302. By 380, Christianity was the Roman Empire's official religion. And Carthage, which is home to St. Perpetua, was also home to another very important early church figure, a man named Tertullian. Today, Tertullian is most famous for saying, I believe because it is absurd. Now, as Abraham Lincoln reminds us, not every quote you find on the internet is true. That version of, I believe because it is absurd, credo, credo ki absurdum comes actually from Voltaire, who said it in French, and he put the quote in Augustine's mouth. Sigmund Freud, who credited the quote back to Tertullian, cited the motto as evidence that religion has an infantile fear of the rational and has to create safeguards any time its cherished standards are questioned. A German sociologist named Max Weber took Voltaire a step further, and he turned the quote into Credo non cad sed quia absurdum est, I believe nothing except that was absurd. He attributed that to St. Augustine. What Tertullian actually said was a little bit more complicated, and I'm going to try to put that quote into a proper context and give the accurate statement it shows a lot about the role absurdity plays in Christianity. Tertullian was writing in a, in a polemic called On the Flesh of Christ, and what he said was, The Son of God was crucified. I am not ashamed, because men should be ashamed of it. And the Son of God died. It is by all means to be believed, because it is absurd. And he was buried and rose again. The fact is certain because it is impossible. But how will all this be true to him if he was not himself true? If he really had not in himself that which might be crucified, might die, might be buried, and might rise again. Tertullian was the son of a Berber centurion. Carthage is in North Africa. He was trained as a lawyer, and he was a midlife convert, and he's got that convert zeal, that soldier's love of discipline, and that prosecuting attorney's thundering rage. He was never happier than when he was denouncing various heresies. He's also famous for a defense of Christians against charges that were going around at that time, that they practiced cannibalism, incest, secret orgies. St. Augustine was one of his biggest fans. and On the Flesh of Christ is aimed at the Marcionites and at other Gnostic heresies that are sweeping North Africa and the Christian world at this time. Now, Marcionism in particular, which he was aimed at in this passage, was influenced by Zoroastrianism. The core idea of the Marcionism was that this world, everything in it, was created by a sadistic demiurge, and that demiurge chose the Jews for his special people. Jesus Christ was the Son of God, but he was not the Son of the demiurge. He was the Son of a greater God. He was the Son of what Marcion called the invisible, indescribable good God, 
he had been sent down here with a message to save us. This God was loving where the Demiurge was angry. This God favors mercy where the Demiurge demands punishment. And he, this God wants to rescue human souls from this Demiurge's filthy pit of suffering and misery. This higher God doesn't come into matter. It's here to get us out of matter. It's not going to be pushed screaming and bloody from a womb. It's not going to be perish, moaning and bloody on a cross. What appeared to be an incarnation was really a manifestation. When we saw Christ preach, we saw Christ crucified. Those were apparitions. Those were illusions that the great God sent into this world to send his message. They were symbols of a greater truth, and they were sadly misunderstood by those who were caught in the Demiurge's snares, who still clung to all of the crazy beliefs of the Demiurge. They rejected all the books of what we today call the Old Testament. They felt that the God the Jews worshipped was an evil God, and that, of course, Jesus Christ could not have been his son. They denied Christ could ever have been born, that Christ could have ever died, and that he could have ever suffered on a cross. And for Tertullian, this just gutted the entire point of Christianity. As he put it, have you then cut away all sufferings from Christ on the grounds that as a mere phantom he was incapable of experiencing them? Was not God really crucified? And having been really crucified, did he not really die? And having indeed really died, did he not really rise again? Falsely did Paul determine to know nothing among us but Jesus and him crucified. Falsely has he impressed upon us that he was buried. Falsely inculated that he rose again. False, therefore, is our faith also. And all that we hope for from Christ will be a phantom. Oh, you most infamous of men who acquits of all guilts the murderers of God. For nothing did Christ suffer from them if he really suffered nothing at all. Spare the whole world one's only hope, you who are destroying the indispensable dishonor of our faith. Marcion, you who tell us that Jesus comes only from the most excellent God who's both simple and good, see how he rather cheats and deceives and juggles the eyes of all and the senses of all, as well as their access and contact to him? You ought rather to have brought Christ down not from heaven but from some troop of mountebanks, not as God beside man, but simply as a man, a magician. Not as the high priest of our salvation, but as the conjurer in a show. Not as the raiser of the dead, but as the misleader of the living. Except that if he were a magician, he must have had a nativity. Tertullian is re reinforcing here what has become the official church position a century after he wrote this, the Council of Nicaea declared that Jesus Christ was God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, one in being with the Father, but also that for our sake he came down from heaven, was born of the Virgin Mary, and became man. This is the point where the eternal joins the temporal. Jesus Christ was born on or around in 1 AD in a small town called Bethlehem to a virgin named Mary. He was not an apparition. He was not a world teacher. He was not a prophet. All that language was available to the early Christians. They could easily have called Jesus by many other names, but they were steadfast on insisting that he was the Son of God, the Son of the One God, and that he was wholly a human being, that he had died, and that he had risen from the dead. And I know that is a crazy story. Tertullian alludes to that when he says, I believe because it's absurd. One implication is, I believe this because nobody would make up a story like this if they were trying to lie. And 
a lot of writers have used that one since C.S. Lewis comes to mind. I have definitely used it. The first people who told this story, the apostles, did not get wealthy because of it. They were all martyred in various gruesome ways. Peter historically was crucified upside down. St. Paul was beheaded. St. Bartholomew was skinned alive. They had every reason, you know, when this was going on to say, hey, okay, guys, look, I, we were just doing this for giggles and now it's all over. Yep, he really died. They didn't. But as a lawyer, Tertullian was also seeding another very important fact. He was acknowledging that Christianity makes impossible claims while simultaneously demanding Christians accept them as fact. And for Catholics, the resurrection is what we call a mysterium fide. That's a mystery of faith. There are truths that are incomprehensible. They're beyond our understanding. One of them, for example, we cannot simultaneously measure a particle's speed and position. There are truths that are unknowable. We can't predict the weather outside our house six months from now. A mystery of faith is both of these it is also a supernatural truth that lies above our finite intelligence. These revealed truths can't be proven by reason, but the Catholic Church also holds that if they are from God, neither can they conflict entirely with reason. Now let's start with the idea of an omnipotent creator. If we accept that, and again, most people throughout history and most people today do believe that there is a creator, although in a, let's accept our Christian thing, all-powerful, or certainly let's even skip all-powerful and say powerful enough to create this universe and everything in it. An entity powerful enough to do that would certainly be capable of doing things which we consider miraculous. Now, we can argue about whether or not that creator chooses to do those things. We can argue about which unusual events are or are not miraculous, but we can't dispute the power which created galaxies and black holes and neutron stars and supernovas could fertilize an ovum or could restore a corpse's vital functions. Those actions would be absolutely out of the ordinary. I mean, they would have been even more out of place in a world that had never heard of surrogate motherhood or CPR. They would certainly be an aberration, a violation of our established laws of nature, but they're not categorically impossible. And if that creator willed them, they would be inevitable. There's definitely a general consensus that science explains the universe better than religion ever did. And there have certainly been some tense moments between science and religion. There still are today. The Catholic Church continues to be a staunch critic on stem cell research and eugenics, for example. But I can also deny science is certainly better at giving us precise distances and measurements Thanks to science, we know that 13.7 billion years ago, give or take a few millennia on either side, our space and time came into being with an enormous blast. We know that the conflagration cooled, the blast radiated outward, matter clumped together to form galaxies and stars, including the sun our Earth revolves around. You know, all we could find out from reading Genesis is all was formless and void, and then God said, let there be light. But how did we get to that Big Bang Theory? Well, in 1927, a Belgian priest named Abbé Georges Lemaitre examined the red shift of galactic light, did a lot of calculations. Lemaitre was this great mathematician. He concluded that the universe was expanding. He started looking at the various different rates in which the galaxies were moving outward by distance. He came up with a number 
that we know it today as the hubble lemaitre constant. It's also known as the Hubble constant. Then Lemaitre ran those numbers backward. He figured out, well, if the universe is expanding outward at this rate now, how far was it contracted in the past? And he concluded that at one point, the universe was much denser than it is now, that all matter in the universe had once erupted from what he called a primeval atom. And he got a lot of pushback on this idea. Lemaitre wrote to Albert Einstein explaining that like maybe your relativity constants would work better if you if you put in that this is an expanding rather than a static universe. And Einstein wrote back, Yo, your equations are correct, but your physics are atrocious. There was another astronomer, Fred Boyle, in England who just scornfully referred to Lemaitre as the Big Bang Man. But after Einstein heard Lemaitre further explain his theories at a conference, he said, this is the most beautiful and satisfactory explanation of creation to which I've ever listened. So in 1951, Pope Pius claimed that Lemaitre's finding validated the Genesis narrative of creation. And Lemaitre was really uncomfortable with this, and later in a private audience with the, with the Pope, he talked about his fears of what's called concordism, and concordism is an effort to harmonize scriptural and scientific teachings, you know, claim that contemporary scientific advancements were foretold in scripture. Lemaitre didn't like this. For Lemaitre, God provided through revelation and through the Holy Scriptures everything we needed for salvation. It was up to us to use our talents and our reason to uncover the other secrets. The way Lemaitre put it was this, once you realize that the Bible does not purport to be a textbook of science, the old controversy between religion and science vanishes. The doctrine of the Trinity is much more obtruse than anything in relativity or quantum mechanics, but being necessary for salvation, the doctrine is stated in the Bible. If the theory of relativity had also been necessary for salvation, it would have been revealed to St. Paul or Moses. And Lemaitre wasn't so much concerned with keeping religion out of science as with keeping science out of religion. The scientific method requires phenomena you can weigh, measure, and qualify. It demands experiments that can be repeated in a laboratory Lemaitre rejected any approach that reduced God to an experimental subject. He saw nothing to be gained by putting God on a dissecting table or in examining the scriptures for evidence that the prophets had visions of televisions, airplanes, or nuclear weapons. Lemaitre's calculations can take us to the moment when a primal point explodes, those calculations have largely been validated by many experiments which have been performed since. So in a scientific term, they're as reliable as scientific evidence gets. We can get to a moment 13.7 years ago where our universe blinked into being. Lemaitre's equations can't tell us how that primal point came into being it can they cannot tell us why that great blast became our universe we know a lot about the forces which shape our creation we know the ones that shape us at the smallest levels we're starting to learn about quantum the quantum universe we're learning about galaxies and hyperstructures and clusters within space you know, as we under, we don't only understand the vastness and the age of the universe, we're looking back further and exploring deeper. But we all that data can't tell us whether those forces were made as a part of a creation or whether those forces are the only thing shuffling the waves and particles. We have to make that decision for ourselves. 
And no matter how we decide, we're going to find ourselves facing absurdity. French philosopher Albert Camus made an entire career out of the question of absurdity. One of the first books he dealt with, one which made him, one of the early books which made him famous, was called Le, Le Mythe de Sisyphe. The Myth of Sisyphus it is a collection of essays. He published it in French in 1942, and it was released in English translation in 1955. The opening essay of that book, An Absurd Reasoning, opens with, There is but one truly serious philosophical problem, and that is suicide. Judging whether or not life is or is not worth living amounts to answering the fundamental question of philosophy. All the rest, whether or not the world has three dimensions, whether the mind has nine or twelve categories, comes afterwards. These are games. One must first answer. Camus notes that the message of every suicide is, ultimately, life is not worth the trouble. There he goes on to ask, so is life worth the trouble? And he makes another uncomfortable observation is that most people, as he puts it, continue making the gestures commanded by existence for many reasons, the first of which is habit. Dying voluntarily implies you have recognized, even instinctively, the ridiculous character of that habit the absence of any profound reason for living, the insane character of that daily agitation, and the uselessness of suffering. And once you've realized that, once you've re admitted to yourself that your good actions are going to bring you no reward in the afterlife, the bad things people have done to you are not going to be punished in the next life, there's nobody out there looking after you. There's nobody out there to help. That's a big thing. And there's a couple ways people try to escape this dark enlightenment. Suicide certainly is one way. I mean, it is definitely, if nothing else, an acknowledgement of the world's absurdity. But it's not the default setting. As we all know, lots of people like to say, Life is not worth living, but yet somehow they seem to keep on living. There's another way you can deal with this knowledge of the absurd, and it's an abstract belief in a transcendent realm or being or idea. One of my favorite philosophers, the Danish philosopher Søren Kierkegaard, said that this is the point where you take what's called the leap of faith. You've probably heard that expression. It comes from Kierkegaard. You understand that you're lost in an abyss and you jump toward the light. You, know, you understand that everything else is chaos and you go toward the one divine order. You know, this is an act of faith. Again, it's an irrational act. I might call it a transrational or an irrational act, but it's not something where you can do this out of concrete material proof. You've got to make that leap of faith. And what Camus calls that in this essay is philosophical suicide. It's instead of killing yourself because life as it is is not worth living, you're you're taking killing your reason you know you're killing the one thing that really sets you aside the one thing that makes you a human and you're killing that because you can't tolerate the universe as it is and Camus proposes a third alternative that's the man of the absurd that's the, that man understands the meaningless nature of the universe knows full well what's in store for him, understands that any deeds he does will likely be washed away soon after he's dead, if not before he's dead, but yet continues keeping on, keeping on. And for that man, Camus provides a new God-man to replace the Christian God-man, 
the Greek hero Sisyphus. As Camus tells it, Sisyphus is trapped in the underworld for crimes which are unclear. You know, Camus very, makes it pretty clear that Sisyphus appears to, by most accounts to have been a decent and honorable man and that whatever he did, his the punishment for his crime is grossly in proportionate to his actual actions. Sisyphus is condemned, as, the, as you probably know the myth, to roll a rock up a mountain endlessly. When he gets the rock to the top, it rolls back down and he has to start again. And so Sisyphus keeps rolling this rock. Sisyphus knows his torment is unending. He knows that the rock is never going to stay at the top any more than Charlie Brown is ever going to kick that football Lucy is holding. But Sisyphus keeps pushing that rock up. And for Camus, Sisyphus reaches the his highest ideal when he's walking down after the stone has rolled. That moment when he's not pushing a stone, when he's truly himself, when he can look at the gods who condemned him with, with scorn, and he can go back and start the whole process over again. That's the god that Camus thought most appropriate for our age. Camus wrote this book in 1942. Fourteen years later, he wrote another book. It was a novel entitled The Fall. That's an absolutely wonderful book. It's a more mature work in that he's talking about a man named Jean-Baptiste Clements. He's a Paris lawyer, and he tells the story to the narrator. It's essentially... Augustine's confessions as if told by an atheist. That's the best way I can describe it. Clemence lays bare this whole story of like the seductions he made to distract himself, all the good deeds he did, and then he realized that he was only doing them for social acclaim. It's this analysis of this self-analysis that really... It's a very, very Christian self-analysis. Clements weighs himself by the law and he finds himself wanting. He realizes he never can live up to that innate moral code, which C.S. Lewis talked about. He marks that you know, this is his encounter with the world's absurdity. In 1942, Camus was talking about freedom, passion, and revolt. By 1956, he'd seen the fruits of freedom, passion, and revolt. Those words could have been carven over pandemonium and Milton's paradise lost because when you're outside the presence of God, that's all you have left. The book ends with Clemence giving you knowledge of your sin but no hope of redemption. It's not clear what other pathways to redemption Camus sought before his untimely death in 1960, but it's clear that from the beginning Camus saw the full ramifications of godless humanity's condition. He understood that we are not capable of saving ourselves and he understood that we have both the freedom to make our own choices and responsibility to accept the consequences of those choices. Camus certainly understood free will. He understood the fall of man. I mean, the title, The Fall, was a definite allusion to the Garden of Eden story. Did Camus ever make the leap of faith a pastor named Howard Muma, he's in his 90s now, has claimed that in the 1950, late 1950s, he spoke with Camus a number of times on Christian subjects and that Camus had asked him before his death in a car accident if he could be baptized. Muma was stationed in France at the time, but there's no hard evidence to prove one way or another if Camus ever did or did not meet 
the minister, that will have to be, like many other things in Christianity, something you accept on faith. Regardless of whether or not Camus ultimately made a decision to turn toward God, he understood the consequences of turning away from God. And while Camus criticized Heidegger in the mythicist of his essays, stating he had committed philosophical suicide by his jump into being into sane, I think that the Camus of the fall would have had much more sympathy with what Heidegger said decades later when he told a Der Spiegel reporter, only a God can save us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, this has been Kanaz Filan, episode 14 of Notes from the End of Time, The Absurdity of Christ. Thank you very much for listening, and may God bless us each and every one. Kanaz Filan, signing out. <laughs>